Good morning. We have 45 devices tuning in, so I'd like to welcome those who are uh, worshiping us with us remotely, wherever you are. Glad that you are with us. And um, we're going to get into another fruit of the Spirit this morning, the fruit of kindness. So uh, if you would, let's bow together and ask God's blessing on this time. God, we ask that uh, you would that you would lead us, that you would guide us as we open your word to understand your will in a greater way. We pray that you would help us with that, that you would remove things of this world that distract us, uh, help us to open our hearts and be ready for you to come and change us and make us what you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been in this series about keeping in step with the Spirit in, in Galatians 5, Uh, Verse 16, verse 18, verse 25, we're told that we need to be walking by the Spirit. We need to be led by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit. And so uh, where is the Spirit leading? Where is the Spirit guiding? And we find that in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. Here's what that looks like. It's a Christian who is loving, a Christian who is joyful. The Spirit's leading us to greater peace Greater kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And so when you think about kindness, kindness is something that, yes, you can work on being more kind, but it's also something the, the more we walk with God, the more we're close with God, the more kindness will naturally come out of us. How much time are we spending with God? How much time are we spending on godly things, Uh, godly entertainment? That does exist, by the way. Uh, Godly entertainment, godly music, godly thoughts. How much time are we spending on that? And we we can contrast that with how much time am I spending on, you know, just earthly things and earthly thoughts and worldly. And some of that is some of that is maybe not right or wrong, but um, but. If it's too much earthly and too much temporal and it's not enough eternal, then then I'm I'm going to act like my earthly nature. How much time do we spend on social media? How much time do we spend on games? We are a gaming society. And I don't just mean video games. Uh, I mean all kinds of games of all ages. If you have one of these... You may have games on this, but whatever your flavor of, of entertainment or your favorite pastime or your uh, things that you enjoy doing, does that cut into God's time, causing us to spend less time with God, meaning I'm less like God, and kindness is one of those things. When we look at love, this chapter on love, 1 Corinthians 13, remember um, love is patient, love is kind. The second word here in, in a description of what love is is the word kind. I, I remember meeting someone for the... Uh, I, it wasn't the first time I met them, but it was early on in a relationship with someone. And I remember them telling me, they said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really a, a nice person, um, caring, I'm thoughtful, um, but if you cross me... If you cross me, I'm not nice. And they, and they said it a little different, but that was basically what they were saying. I'm really good and loyal and loving to my friends and people who are respectful to me, but so help me to those that cross me, it's a different deal. You might want to look out. You might want to watch out. You might want to be careful. That's not kind. That's not kind, is it? Scripture teaches that's not kind. That's that's how the world does. That's how worldly people do. That's how criminals do. That's how the worst of our society does. They're very loyal to their friends, but not to their enemies. And God teaches us to be kind to our enemies. Look at Colossians 3.12. This is talking about how we are to look. It says, put on, meaning this is what, you know, we put on, you put on clothes that, that 
uh, you like how they look. We live in a prosperous nation and a time when we don't wear clothes just for the function of them, but for the style. You wear clothes for how you choose the clothes you wear, for how they look to other people. And this is put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. And those words there, we're not talking about what to put on yet. This is just a description of who we are. You are God. If you're a Christian, you're God's chosen ones. You are holy because God makes you holy. You are beloved. You're loved by God. That's who you are. And then the first item to put on, compassionate hearts. Compassionate hearts. That's the opposite of what I was describing with the person who said, I'm good to you if you're good to me, but if you cross me, watch out. That's not, compa- that's not a compassionate heart. So compassionate hearts. Number two, kindness. Humility, meekness. Notice those two words, humility and meekness. Those two are necessary to be kind. You have to have humility to be kind to someone who's not acting kind. They're not acting nice. They're being rude. Someone cuts you off in traffic. How are you to be kind to them? You need some humility. Just step down from your high horse for a minute. It's okay. When someone's rude to you, we need humility. We need meekness. And then patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Now, there are other things Scripture teach about when when someone has something against you, go to them, talk to them. When someone has a complaint against you, when you're frustrated with someone else, you know what also Scripture teaches us to do? And that is forgive them. Just forgive them. But preacher, you don't understand what they did. See how they hurt me. See how wrong that was. Now listen, let me tell you the whole story and you'll understand. That's, that's what forgiveness is, is when someone trespasses against you. Forgive them as the Lord has forgiven you. We say, you don't, you don't understand what they did. See, they acted in a way that is just completely unacceptable. What does that mean, by the way? You don't accept it? It already happened. What do you mean unacceptable? Well, it's just unacceptable. It's a real close cousin to inexcusable. Inexcusable. A person shouldn't act like that. A Christian sure shouldn't act like that. It's inexcusable. And that's exactly who God's telling us to forgive. Forgive that one. Have you ever betrayed God? Have you ever trespassed against God? Have you ever sinned or fallen short of God's glory? Have you ever disappointed God? You ever done wrong when you knew to do right? Have you ever asked for forgiveness of something and then later did the exact same thing again? Have you ever committed the inexcusable to God? Unacceptable. Absolutely we have. And, God, and we want God's forgiveness on that. And so God has forgiven us. We, he asks us to forgive others. And kindness is intertwined with that. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted. So we have the word here, tenderhearted. We back up to last scripture, and it says, Compassionate hearts. Tenderhearted. Tenderhearted is the opposite of hard-hearted. Do you know... What it feels like when someone wrongs you, you feel angry, and then what do you do with how you feel toward them? You're angry, but then you may calm down from your anger, and when you think about what they did to you that was wrong, it was unacceptable, it was inexcusable, how do you feel toward them? You're not angry anymore, what are you now? You might be bitter. We might be bitter. Do you have a forgiving heart? You ever had someone suggest, what about forgiving them? And you got mad at the, at the mere suggestion? You want to, you're asking me to forgive them? That means you're nowhere near forgiving them. You need to, but you're on the opposite end of the spectrum. What are you? Hard-hearted. Do you know what it feels like to be hard-hearted towards someone? Where you have resentment toward them, you have bitterness toward them, you have hard feelings. You, you might consider yourself 
Do you consider yourself a good person? Yeah, I'm a good person. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm loving, I'm kind to people, I'm considerate. Um, but have you ever been hard-hearted? Do you know what it means to be hard-hearted? Do you know what it feels like to have that place? When you think of that person, what do you, what do you feel? You feel strength, some anger maybe, some bitterness, some resentment, but you feel this hardness in this place toward them. You're not tender-hearted, you're hard-hearted. Do we know what that feels like? So it's no surprise that when Scripture talks about being kind to people, it says, guess what? You're going to need to soften that heart. You're going to need your heart to be softer. We want to harden it. Why? So we don't get hurt again. We don't want to be hurt again. And God tells us, be soft-hearted. Be able for someone to hurt you again. God will help us heal. So tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ could say through Christ. Christ paid our debt. That's why it's in Christ. As God in Christ forgave you. I want to give you three reasons to be kind this morning. And we're working toward uh, the first of those. We're kind of laying a consistent idea here. Luke 6, 35. Love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Let's stop there for a second. Anything sound odd about that? You know, love your enemies. We can halfway swallow that pill. Love your enemies. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure. I want good things to happen to them. Sure, God help them. Love your enemies. Loving your enemies means doing good for your enemies. It's not just an attitude. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't really wish any bad on them anymore. I feel like I love them. That's part way. You've made progress. Loving your enemy means doing good to them, lend to them. Let's keep going. Expect nothing in return. Why would a person do that? No earthly person would do that. No worldly person would do that. Without Christ teaching us to do that, we would not do that. Why would you do that? They're a bad person. They're your enemy. They're not nice to you. They're not kind to you. But you lend, expect nothing in return. And your reward will be great. You'll be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Have you ever been ungrateful to God? Have you ever committed wrong and, and feeling like It'll be okay. Forgiveness will be there. See, Christ died for my sins. Have we ever been ungrateful for Christ's sacrifice or treated it as something less than holy? Have we ever grumbled and complained? Do we ever do that about life? We've gone, we, in the past few years, we've been through a flood. We've been through a pandemic. Did we grumble any? <clears throat> I think we might be in a recession. I'm not going to really stir that pot too much. Uh, but we might even be in a recession right now. Uh, we're definitely in an, a time of inflation. So do we ever grumble? You ever been ungrateful to God? We might not consider ourselves the evil. Maybe that's who we would consider bad. But we fall short as Christians, surely the ungrateful is speaking about us and God, look at this, God is kind to the Christians and he's kind to the evil, to, to those that are the worst, whatever, whoever that might be. There's a spectrum here. God's kind to his enemies and you and I have been God's enemies and God was kind to us. He's still kind to us. How many times have you failed God? We talked about this one day. How many times have you failed God? He's still kind to you. So God doesn't ask us to do something that he's not already done for us. Is it sounding any better? It's hard to do, being kind 
to someone that's, that's not easy to be kind to. But here's reason number one to do that. Because God has been kind to you. We're kind to our enemies. We're kind to rude people. We're kind to jerks, thieves, criminals. Because God was kind to us. All right, let's go on to uh, reason number two. Proverbs eleven sixteen: A gracious woman gets honor, a violent and violent men get riches. A man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. The New American says the the merciful man does himself good. You ever heard the phrase uh, when someone cuts their nose to spite their face? You cut it, this is a, I say things to my children sometimes and they don't understand what I'm saying. I'm using, uh, you know, sayings from times in the past. Cut your nose to spite your face means you're upset with your face and so you're going to do something spiteful to your face. You cut off your nose, well that hurts you. You're, you're angry and what you're doing actually hurts you. So this is the opposite of that. When, you, when we are kind... We th- you might think, well, that only benefits the, the jerk that I'm being kind to. It actually comes back and benefits you. When we are kind, we are blessed. We are benefited. 1 Peter 3, 9, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. When you bless someone, it, being, it means be, be kind to them. How easy is it for you when someone says something rude, how quick does something rude come off your tongue? About like that. I can't snap really good today. I need a snapper. How quick? And for me, it depends on my mood. If I'm in a really good mood, it's, I can be more slow in that reaction. But if I'm cranky, if I'm in a cranky mood, it can come quick. My reaction, you, if you're going to say something rude, I can, I can quickly reply something rude. It's natural. It's easy. I've done it many times. Haven't you? How, how good are you? <clears throat> How's your reaction when someone says something rude and you say something nice? How good a reaction time do you have there? How quick is that? Still having a hard time snapping. Someone says something rude and you say, well, God bless you. (laughs) Well, that's an interesting thought you have there. Well, I think maybe we ought to pray about that. How quick, what kind of reaction do we have? We, 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 We tend to live like the world but a little bit better and God is saying there's so much better that He wants to lead us to be. The Spirit is trying to lead us to be so much better, so much more like God, because God is kind to the ungrateful. Let's read another one. Galatians 6, 7. It says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. Stop there for a minute. What does it mean to sow to your own flesh? So we have a contrast here between words flesh and spirit. This is talking about the Holy Spirit. But that also encompasses this. We each have a we have a side of us that's selfish, it's earthly, it's that's the word flesh refers to that. Your your just physical nature, what we want. Then we have a spiritual side. We have a good side. You have that voice in the back of your head that says, you know, you really should, should not be mean. You really should, be, you really should do whatever is good. We have a good side to us, a spiritual side, a side that's in tune with the Holy Spirit. And they're in conflict with each other. So the one who sows to his flesh, what does that mean? That means I do what I want to do. If I like this or that, or here's how I want to live, or here's what works for me, or here's, here's just how I'm wired, because we're all, we all have a fallen nature. None of us are perfect. We weren't created in a perfect way. We all have a selfish, earthly nature to do what we want. 
That's what it means to sow to his own flesh. It means you live life your way, how you want to do it. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So if I live my life my way, I'm going to reap from that. And that's corruption. It is corrupt. When people live their own way, it's corrupt. Our, you look at the world and look at societies who, are, who operate outside of God's will and outside of following Scripture, it doesn't turn out well. There's a lot of problems. But we want to reap eternal life. Verse 9 says, Let us not grow weary of doing good. That statement means it's hard to do good. You'll get tired of it. It's hard because your flesh doesn't want to do that. But keep doing it, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. By the way, there's a false teaching uh, in many churches about uh, once you're saved, if God saves you, you're always saved, period. It doesn't matter what you do. But there are many, many scriptures that teach that we have to walk with God. We have to, live, we have to uh, be faithful to God for salvation to the end. We have to be faithful to the end. So uh, that's what this is saying, if we do not give up. In due season, though, your reward, our reward for being kind to people, it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. But our reward is coming. Look at Luke 6.37. It says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. How much blessing do you want God to give you? Do you want God to give you health blessings? To be a healthy person? To not be sick or with disease? Absolutely. Do we want God to give us financial blessings where we're financially stable? Absolutely. Do we want God to give us relationship blessings? Sure. Um, other types of blessings? What do we want God to give us? Lots of good things. You know, a little? Do you want God to, to bless you a little? No, we, we request a lot. Go ahead, God, pour it on. But God says the way you dish it out to those who are ungrateful, to those who are evil. How do you treat those people? That's how you'll be blessed. That's the part about judge not, condemn not. We're talking about uh, people that we're frustrated with, maybe we're hurt by. And God says, forgive. You bless them. You show kindness to them. It will be measured back to you. So the second reason to be kind is, be, is in order to receive blessings. God's not going to give us blessings. And the greatest and really the ultimate is eternal life. God's not going to give it. If we want to receive eternal life from God, but we don't want to bless or forgive anyone else, then we'll be rejected. Proverbs 19, 17. Um, look at this. This is, a, this is really a powerful thought that, that uh, is new to me. Proverbs 19, 17 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. He lends to the Lord. The Christian Standard Bible reads, Kindness to the poor is a loan to the Lord. A loan to the Lord. You ever loan something to someone? You ever loan someone something that was valuable to you? And then maybe you worried about how, how are they going to treat it? Are they, when am I, when, are, am I going to get it back? That's what a loan is. Will I get it back? What condition will it be when I get it back? Have you ever thought that when you lend to someone who is needy, you're lending to God? Did you even know you could lend to God? Isn't that a weird thought? See, God has everything. Everything belongs to him. How can you lend to God? But remember when Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. 
And, and people would say, well, when did we do that? And Jesus said, whenever you did it to the least of these. That would be the poor. That would be the needy, those who are down or struggling. When we do something kind to someone who needs it, everyone needs it, especially those who are vulnerable, you lend to the Lord. What if Jesus needed something that you had? What if God needed something you had? God said, will you lend it to me? God, it's all yours anyway. Yeah, I'll lend it to you. And God says, God wants us to look at it that way when we're helping someone else. When we're extending kindness to someone, we're extending it to God. That's how God tells us to think about it. And so the third reason to be kind to others is because it honors God. When we're kind to others, we're being kind to God. It's a, isn't that an amazing thought? Because I, we're all about being kind to God. Yeah, I'll do it for God. I just won't do it for this jerk. I don't want to do it for him. He's a jerk. He's rude. He's ungrateful. He's irritable. Unacceptable. And then one final, final thought for us. Proverbs 31, 26 talks about a noble woman. It says, she opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. We need to teach the next generation to be kind. Our world is not going to teach them that. They're not going to learn to love their enemy anywhere else but at the foot of Christ. We need to teach kindness, don't we? And maybe someone taught you kindness. Um, I remember mom teaching us to be nice, talk nice. If you have a sibling, uh, if, you're, if you have multiple children or grandchildren that sometimes fuss and argue, that's good. That gives them an opportunity to be kind to someone that they don't want to be kind to. We need to teach our children to be kind. We're going to sing this song of encouragement. Um, and you may be here with something heavy on your heart this morning that we could pray for you about. We could stop and lift you up to the Father in prayer. We'd love to do that. Or you may be here and, and you're not right with God and you know you're not right. And you know you need to submit to God and submit your life. And in the waters of baptism, have your sins washed away. We'd love to help you with that if there's anyone in need of that. If you'd come while we stand and sing. There's a thousand